start recording here. We're going to pick up just a couple of concepts that we didn't talk about in the, con in the context of the genetic counseling unit because they're concepts that don't necessarily apply as cleanly to humans as they do to other species. And you might suspect that one of the traits we're going to talk about is specific to horses, hence my intro with the horse of many colors. So, the two words that I would like you to write down are incomplete dominance and codominance. Okay? These are two terms that I want you to write down. So, in everything that we've done so far, we've looked at every single gene and we've said, oh, is this trait what or what? Dominant or recessive? And always before, the answer has been, this one's dominant, this one's recessive. This one's dominant, this one's recessive. And it's a copy of the same gene, and it's just got two versions. And one overrides, the other one hides it. So that's what we've been used to. Dominant versus recessive. Well, what if we had something that wasn't that cut and dry? Now, we've talked about things that aren't that cut and dry in humans. Um, one of them that I said, you know, we can't, it's not as easy as you think, was what? Well, there are three things I can think of just looking out at all of you and your pretty, pretty eyes. Eye color is not cut and dry. It's not simple. If we lined everybody up in this room and took pictures of your eyeballs... There are how many of us in this room right now? Just under 20. We'd probably have 15 different colors of eyes. Okay. I mean, eye color is subtle, and there are all kinds of different variations. It's not a cut and dry dominant recessive. That's because that's something that requires more than one gene. Hair color is the same way. Skin color is the same way. All of those things require more than one gene. But we have things that are single genes that still aren't as clean and clear-cut as dominant versus recessive. And we're going we're gonna to talk about those today, incomplete dominance and codominance. So we're going to start off with, actually, let's start off with codominance. Codominance. So anybody here ever been on a team or played a team sport? Okay. What do you call the, the lucky person who's sort of in charge, the student who has the responsibility of sort of heading everything up, making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing? They're the what? Team captain. team captain. You ever in a situation where there were two team captains? What do they call them? Co-captains. Co-captains. Because they're working together. In, in an ideal situation, they're each working every bit as hard. Well, co-dominance is where you have two versions of a gene, and they're both dominant. How does that work? It means if you have both, both characteristics show up. So I'm going to show you another picture of a horse. We have this pretty horse. What color is it? Good eye. Um, a lot of people would just say it's gray. Um, it's actually called a blue roan. Um, very often there's a color of gray that looks kind of blue or kind of smoky. There are also red roans. Has anybody seen a roan horse before? R-O-A-N. Okay. What's so special about roan horses? Why are we talking about them when we talk about codominance? <gasps> they are two different colors. So when we have something like a roan horse... So that would be a roan horse. That is a roan horse, yeah. That, that, is, that horse, if you looked closely at its coat... And, of course, I picked the absolute worst background for this. Here, let's... Nope, that's still a bad background. Oh, Yvay. We'll do this on a yellow background. <laughs> that's about the only thing that's going to work. If you looked real closely at that horse, and I'm going to draw a terrible horse here. <coughs> it's not terrible. Yes, it is. It's a donkey. It's a donkey. That's what I was thinking. But you know what? It's going to be our own horse for the moment. If you looked real closely at that horse, you would see that for almost every black hair, there was a white hair next to it. So that horse is not really gray. Its hairs aren't gray. 
It's literally got black and white hairs. Is that a zebra? No, it's not striped. Every single inch of its hide, the hairs coming out of it, are two different colors. Well, how's that possible? Because in horses, there are some coat configurations where we have a gene for black coat and a gene for white coat. And they are versions of the same gene, but when you inherit one of each, you actually have fur of different colors. So rather than one being dominant over the other, when you have both of them, you end up exhibiting both traits. Okay? So a horse that has a genotype BW, and in co-dominance and incomplete dominance, we actually, remember in um, normal dominant situations, we always use the same letter in just an uppercase and a lowercase? Yeah. We can't do that here because neither of them is recessive. So we use different letters for the two variants of the trait because they are going to be dominant together. They're going to actually form a sort of a third option. So if you have, so we don't have that situation. If you have a black mare and a white stallion, We can do a Punnett square for this. What are, well, that's boring. What's the genotype <coughs> of all their offspring? BW. BW. What's the phenotype of all their offspring? Yeah, it's black and white, or roan. So, 100% so of their offspring are black and white. What if we make it a little bit more interesting? Let's say we cross two roan horses. So we have a roan mare and a roan stallion. What do we expect to see in their offspring? So, we have three genotypes. Well, we always had three genotypes when doing straight up dominant and recessive. So we have big B, big B, big B, big W, and big W, big W. One, two, and one. But when we were doing straight up dominant and recessive, how many phenotypes did we have? Just two. Big teeth, little teeth, long tail, short tail, um, you know, dark fur, light fur. How many phenotypes do we have here? We have three suddenly. So in complete, in co-dominance and in incomplete dominance, we have three phenotypes all of a sudden. So we see with two, what would these parents be, homo or heterozygous? With two heterozygous parents, we see for genotypes a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio in their offspring. Phenotypes, we got, I'm going to have to shrink this, we got black, roan, and white. What's our ratio here? One to two to one, because each of the phenotypes has its own, or each of the genotypes has its own phenotype. You don't have that case of dominance where the um, dominant genotype um, shows the dominant trait in a heterozygous offspring. Okay, let's practice an example of incomplete dominance in horses. We'll still do a roan horse, but we'll do an even prettier roan horse. A, a picture of a red roan just off Wikipedia. So 
in a red roan, we would have a gene for red coat and a gene for white coat. If we had two heterozygous parents, it would be the same as the one we just did. Now, let's say we take a red roan, little red roan mare, and we breed her to a white stallion. What are, so daddy is all white, big W, big W. What genotype and phenotype ratios you're going to see there? Um, so back to our little strawberry roan, or our red roan. So we've got this horse that's got um, a roughly equal number of red and white hairs in its coat, and it sort of gives it this strawberry appearance. Um, her genotype, this little mare, would be RW, and we said we're going to breed her with a white stallion. So, do the Punnett square. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep recording. <coughs> I'm going to ask you to answer using finger voting. So, one, two, three, four. Of the offspring of this little strawberry roan and this little white stallion, how many of their offspring are pure white? Excellent. Two of them. How many of their offspring are pure red? I see a few people who have it. Okay. How many of their offspring are strawberry roans or red roans? Okay. Let's, let's bring my screen up and we'll look at it together. Okay. So we have three possible genotypes. How many red horses do we get out of this? None. We have no pure red horses. How many roans do we get? We said two. And we get two white. Well, now... It's not really two. What we're saying is roughly half of their offspring, it's 50%, it's a 50% chance. So really the ratio of roan to white here is going to be one to one. And we say that 50% of their offspring would be roans. 50% we would expect to be white. Now, if this particular mare and stallion had ten foals over the course of their life together. Does that mean we're going to get five and five? No. We, you know, over a lot of births, we would expect to see that average. She could pop out three roan colts. Could happen. You know, just like somebody can have three male children in a row or six female. I have cousins who have six little girls. Well, they're not little girls anymore. But um, six beautiful daughters. What are the odds? 50-50 on every pregnancy. That's the odds. Um, so, you know, that 50%, this is one of the things I saw in some genetic counseling projects. So we'll talk more, um, if you got below a threshold grade, about corrections that you can do. One of the things that I saw was in letters to clients, you said things like, 25% of your offspring will be affected. Well, the chances for any one of your offspring to be affected are one in four. You know, it doesn't mean that 25% of your offspring will be affected. So, you know, we, we say, well, we would expect about 50% of their offspring would be roans, about 50% would be white. That means for each offspring, it's a 50 50 shot at being roan or white. All right, so that's co dominance in a nutshell. That, that right there, that is codominance. Let's go back to our blackboard. Oops. So in codominance, both colors are dominant. So you see both of them, you see them together. You see the red fur and the white, the red hairs and the white hairs, the black hairs and the white hairs. They're codominant. Well, what was the other word that I asked you to write down at the beginning? Incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance is a little bit different. In incomplete dominance, rather than both of them being dominant, neither of them is actually dominant. Okay? So this is a case where neither trait will hide the other. 
and the classic example that's given. So these are petunias. And this is the classic example that's given. We got red petunias, we got white petunias, and we got pink petunias. Now, this is incomplete dominance. And I'm going to tell you that these pink petunias are genuinely pink. That is not a series of red and white spots. The whole thing is pink. This is an example of incomplete dominance. So, when we look at the genotypes for petunias, similar, similarly to the horses, we have a gene, a version of a gene that would give a plant red flowers. We have a version of a gene that would give a plant white flowers. But when we have the genotype, so the genotype RR has red flowers, WW has white flowers, but RW, now in the roan horse example that would have been red and white, but here the, the RW just gives you pink, okay? So it's an actual blend of the two because neither of them is dominant, neither of them can hide the other. So in the, in the co-dominance, they're both dominant, they both show up. Here, neither of them shows up and you actually get some third option. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's try one of these. Okay, so somebody is a plant breeder and they've taken two pink petunias and they're crossing them. And plant breeders actually do this. They put little bags over the plant because what did we say plant sperm is? Pollen. And if you don't put a little bag over the plant, guess what? That sperm goes everywhere. So every plant that is within a radius is just going to get covered in that plant sperm. So in order to control which plants breed with which, um, plant breeders will actually take little tiny paper bags and tie it over the flowers. And then when they're ready to breed two plants, they take a little paintbrush and they tease pollen off of one plant and they apply it to the other flower. And that's how you breed two plants and you get just this one to breed with just this one rather than a free-for-all. Woohoo! Because then you never know what you're going to get. Okay, so we've got two pink petunias. First off, what's their genotype? RW. So we have RW crossing with RW. Do your Punnett square. So since I can't hide my screen, I'll just leave it blank. Um, doing the finger vote again. How many genotypes are possible? Okay, we have all three. So we might have RRs, we might have RWs, whoops, terrible R, and we might have WWs. How many RRs do we get? One. How many RWs? Two. One. Is one, two, one starting to look really, really familiar? Like anytime you have two heterozygous parents, you get this one to two to one ratio. Okay. How many phenotypes are possible? Three also. Because RR gives you what color flowers? Red. RW gives you? Pink. And WW gives you? White. So again, what's our, what's our phenotype ratio? One to two to one. So we would expect roughly a quarter of their offspring to be red flowered, a quarter of their offspring to be white flowered, and about half their offspring we would expect to have pink flowers. Questions, comments, concerns? If I gave you a quiz on that, could you pass it easily? I think you could. I think you're really good at this point at doing Punnett squares. Um, so, all right, let's pause. All right, um, tomorrow we're going to wrap up the last of the genetic ideas that we haven't seen yet, and then we will start in 5C, we will probably start some of our cell reproduction leading into DNA. So... That's what's on tap. Those of you who still need emails from me, I'm going to go make sure I've got all that cleaned up.